100 years ago, in the small rural village of Mvezu, a human being was born. He, together with a whole group of freedom fighters, changed the course of history for South Africa. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this week's Anur The Light. July 18th commemorates the birth of Tata Nelson Mandela and we bring you this tribute. Nelson Lolihlahla Mandela was born on the 18th of July 1918 in the village of Mvezu in the Eastern Cape. As a young boy, he tended to cattle and sheep in the majestic rural areas that surrounded his home. At the age of 23, he finally left the Eastern Cape and moved to Johannesburg where he would study law and become a freedom fighter. I think one has to recognize that uh, Nelson Mandela, as he is fondly known as Madiba, is a son of this country, is a leader of this country, is indeed a freedom fighter of this country that makes us all proud, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Hindu. In terms of humanity, we must recognize that Nelson Mandela is most probably one of the most refined human beings that South Africa has ever produced. And in terms of that recognition, I think one needs to be absolutely fair in recognizing the humanity and the great leadership in this human being known fondly to us as Madiba. I think there is much to learn from the personality of Madiba. I think one of the most outstanding examples is that during the times and the challenges that South Africa faced, known as the time of apartheid and discrimination, I think for me what stands out very brilliantly about Nelson Mandela was his steadfastness for the concern for the larger well-being of the South African society. He may have even had the opportunity to have compromise, but his steadfastness on his principles, not purely for his individual interests, but for the interests of the larger South African society, white and black and colored and Indian and all, and that is what we celebrate today, that in the history of South Africa, there has been a human being known as Nelson Mandela who stood very firm on his principles for the future and the well-being of the larger South African society. Over time, he became a respected politician fighting for the rights of black people in South Africa. In 1964, Nelson Mandela and seven others were sentenced to life in prison, of which he spent 27 years behind bars. He was eventually released in 1990 and would go on to become president of South Africa. All South Africans enjoy the freedom he fought for. For us who are not white, Freedom Day has got a, a special significance. If you think of the apartheid days, just a simple thing, which is simple but very serious, there were these boards all over, non-Europeans not allowed, Europeans only. Uh, there was even a board that said uh, uh, non-Europeans and dogs not allowed, so re reduce people who were not white to the level of dogs. So we were the lesser human beings under apartheid. What 94 brought and freedom they brought was dignity. Dignity as equal human beings. It is in your hands to make of our world a better one for all. July 18th has become known as Mandela Day and seeks to encourage South Africans to dedicate their time to make South Africa a better place to live in. Nelson Mandela is an icon for, he's an icon for the entire world. Wherever you go, and we've been to many countries, the minute you say you're from South Africa, people are like, you know, where on earth is South Africa? But you say Nelson Mandela's name, they know exactly where you come from and, and what you represent as a country. And therefore, uh, I think Muslims in South Africa and Muslims around the world uh, would like to associate with the principles of justice, equality that Nelson Mandela stood for throughout his life. We found uh, the Barikal Amal group out in Polokwane. They've done some sterling work in the past with us, putting up a park for disabled children. 
Uh, and then we, we, we found Breadline Africa, who actually does the conversion of these containers into libraries. And that's basically how we got ourselves involved in this, in this project. And I must say it was, uh, we really enjoyed being part of it. Well, you know, the, there's, there's a term in, in the Islamic uh, world called Baraka, blessings, uh, something that you, uh, it comes out of something else, you know. And by engaging in, 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 in the library project, which was one of our very first projects that we did in terms of social development and giving back to the community, there's been so much that has come after that. We've given bicycles to, to learners. We've, you know, uh, worked in communities. We've been to Marikana and, and helped in humanitarian efforts there. It's brought about a whole new dimension uh, to the work that we do here at the station. And it's been so, you know, it's been a wonderful experience for us. Nelson Mandela was a tireless freedom fighter. And after his passing, the commemoration of Mandela Day grew in stature. I think we look at the excellent human qualities and the interests of humanity. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi said, "Khayrun nasi anfa'uhum linnas." The best of humanity is he the most beneficial to humanity. And so, when we as Muslims or Islam want to value Mandela, Madiba, we value him through this very powerful expression of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who saw in us to be the beneficiaries for humanity, to play that very important role to benefit humanity. And I think that uh, one must be honest in recognizing that uh, that concurs with the great values of Islam, and that uh, as we have the obligation to express our gratitude uh, to people who have contributed to the well-being of human beings at large, I think we have that obligation to express that in more than one way and say uh, congratulations and thank you for the refined qualities in such uh, a personality. Muslims who have been part of the struggle are encouraged to also give of their time to mark not only this great man but to contribute to the upliftment of all who live in South Africa. We owe our freedom to heroes such as Tata Madiba and others and can repay their sacrifice with our contribution to society. Molana Baum is ready with this week's Q&A segment. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah ya wahda, wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da, amma ba'da. Respected viewers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We begin today's program on the Q&A segment of the Anur program by praising Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the favors that he has bestowed upon us. And we send salutation upon all the messengers of the Almighty and those who follow them in righteousness and guidance. And amongst the questions that we have today, what is the ruling of eating vegetarian foods that has been prepared by a non-Muslim, particularly if it has been part of a ritual? Bear in mind, Allah Ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, لا تحرموا طيبات ما حل الله لكم do not make haram, though that which Allah Ta'ala has made halal. There are certain foods that are neutral, and normally it would be permissible to consume if, for example, it is prepared by someone else, provided there is no contamination. If there is no contamination of vegetarian food with meat or non-halal items, it would be permissible to consume it normally. However, if it is part of a prayer ritual, and it has been dedicated to someone other than the Almighty, because there is a great amount of sensitivity in Islam with regard to it that everything that we slaughter only be in the name of the Almighty Allah. Then if it is part of a prayer ritual, then we've got to stay away from such food. So bear in mind, if it is part of a prayer ritual, we stay away from it. But if it's not part of a prayer ritual and there is no contamination, then it will be permissible to consume that food. The second question, is it permissible for me to read my mahram female relatives in prayer, such as my wife, mother and sister? Yes, it is permissible. Not only is it permissible if, for example, you have a situation that you have not been able to follow the Jamaat and you have not been able to partake in the Jamaat, then it will be good for you to do the Jamaat with your family members. Very good to do that. With regard to the Azan and Iqama, the Azan of the vicinity would be sufficient. So you don't have to give the Azan. If, however, you are in a vicinity where there is no Azan given, then the male should give the Azan and the male should give the Iqama and lead the prayers. The third question that we have is an interesting question, and it's not only an interesting question, it is something that happens many a times in our communities, unfortunately. 
I often see people who are not talking to each other because of personal differences praying in the same mosque. Is their salat valid? Two points with regard to this matter. One is not to talk to one another. Allah does not like disputes and arguments. Allah says, Wala tanaza'u. Don't dispute with one another. Allah will take away your strength. Allah will make you weak. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was coming to tell people of the precise night of the night of power. Two people were arguing and that knowledge was taken away from the ummah till the day of judgment because of the perniciousness of two people arguing in disputes. Allah does not like disputes and especially amongst Muslim brothers who Allah Ta'ala says innamal mu'minuna ikhwah verily Muslims are brothers and sisters unto one another. This brotherhood requires certain degree of affection and love between people and part of that is not to cut off ties out of hostility. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said It is not permissible for a person to remain aloof from another Muslim out of hostility. Sometimes it can happen you don't speak to someone for more than three days but here staying aloof out of hostility for more than three days. And then one hadith Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said on the day of Monday and Thursday, Allah Ta'ala inspect the deeds of the believers and Allah Ta'ala forgive the people except those with whom there is still hostility and there is argumentation. And Allah Ta'ala says, leave them aside, leave them aside, leave their, leave their situation until they reconcile with one another. For people not to speak to one another is something that is a very great sin. My suggestion is, even if you don't agree with someone tremendously, have less to do with him. Don't speak to him too much because it creates arguments, but reconcile with him. The, with regard to the Salat, he must continue his Salat. While it is wrong for him not to speak, that's a different matter. But the Salat itself would be valid and he must continue performing his Salat. However, he must make every effort to reconcile with the very same people with whom he's reading Salat in front of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala give us love and muhabbat between us in every occasion. وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين. If you have any questions for Molana, then please let us know. Details are on screen. South Africa is a major tourist hub and it's now seeing an upsurge in Muslim travelers. We spent some time with a Houting-based tour operator to find out more. South Africa remains one of the best locations to visit with a vast array of things to see, do and experience. Globally, Muslim tourism has been increasing year on year and while South Africa has a relatively small Muslim population, the history, influence and appeal has become very attractive, especially to other Muslim tourists. The Muslim tourists that come here like to see the Islamic presence and many of them are surprised because they don't know about it. So when we see a mosque in Houghton, for example, or we see a mosque in Santon, they, they, they wouldn't have expected this unless they came here. And seeing the large number of Muslims and the halal restaurants to offer, they like that. They also want to be able to enjoy the adventure and the sites that we have in South Africa while they're not compromising on, on their Muslim and their Islamic requirements. A recent global survey placed South Africa in fourth place for Muslim tourists and since then the floodgates have opened as Muslim travellers are arriving in ever-increasing numbers. Khalid saw an opportunity and opened one of the very first Muslim travel and tour companies. Well, I love travel. I lived abroad for a number of years. Backpacking, for example, through Europe. You know, I, I was in Italy for three weeks and I didn't have a single ounce of meat for those three weeks. Okay, well, it was pizza and pasta, so that was fine. Um, but this can become difficult for people who have a specific diet. Um, finding a place to pray was obviously a bit of a challenge as well. I went into this to be able to offer this to people overseas. I love meeting new people. Um, that's one of the perks of this job. I love meeting new people. I love getting people to interact because it helps us drop the barriers that we have set up between ourselves. And I see that actualizing in all of the tours when we've got clients coming from Malaysia interacting with people from Boer Cup, for example, or we've got clients coming from the US interacting with people in Soweto. It's lovely to see that, those cultures coming together and that, that's a personal joy for me. There is something for everyone on Khalid's tours. He takes tourists on religious, historical, as well as safari rides. We offer shark cage diving, for example, and we've had women in hijab doing shark cage diving. So our partners down in Khan Spai know exactly how to make Muslim women feel comfortable when they're doing that. We've had 
Muslim families go bungee jumping. So all of the adventure sports are available to people. As long as they like it, we make it available to them. So there's various activities here on the reserve. We've got nine predator species that we have here on the reserve, as well as 17 herbivore species. We've got more than 10 tour options, whether it be a 45-minute to an hour tour or a three-hour tour that goes around our entire reserve, as well as animal interactions so people can go out for walks with our cheetah, um, get to feed our giraffe, so various things like that. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, international Muslim guests. Um, we have an inflow of about 30,000 people a month here at the park. Our restaurant, our wetlands restaurant, does um, serve halal food uh, to accommodate our guests as well as the fact that we have a Muslim prayer area on site to cater for our guests. For the Muslim tourists, finding halal food is one of the biggest draw cards and one where South Africa isn't lacking. Many establishments have awoken to the Muslim market and there is a culinary feast that awaits in halal food. We're fortunate in South Africa in that over the last 15 or 20 years we've had Muslims coming in from all different parts of the world and they've brought their culinary skills with them. So we've got people coming in from Pakistan and Bangladesh and Morocco and Jordan and Syria and they bring all of these unique flavors. And then we've got all of the local flavors as well. So you've got proper South African flavors. The, 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 the dishes would vary from Johannesburg to Cape Town. So in Cape Town, we would offer traditional Cape Malay dishes. In Johannesburg, we would offer after Friday lunch, your possibly a dal and rice. But there's so much of a variety for clients to choose from. We're spoiled for choice in this place. It is estimated that the Muslim tourist market will be worth over a trillion dollars within the next few years. And South Africa stands to gain a very decent slice of the spy. Few places can enthrall, entertain and satisfy better than this beloved country. If you're looking for ideas on what to see, do and where to eat, then our travel segment is just the place. This week, we're in KwaZulu-Natal. The KZN Midlands really doesn't disappoint with its offering of fresh produce from local farms and a variety of homemade organic treats. Welcome to the Kaku Farmers Market and this is a local fresh produce market. It happens every Saturday from 7 to 11 um, and we're in the Kaku Valley, well just outside of Kauai. So really everyone, we try to cater for everybody. We've got an amazing kids area outside so families can come and, and other locals do their weekly food shop here. People come part of the Midlands Meander, they make this their first stop, gather up a picnic basket and then go and explore the rest of the Midlands. It doesn't get any fresher than this. We have a variety of uh, fresh veggies and those kind of everyday things. We've got a lot of really niche uh, items, a lot of organic stuff, and then also things to eat. So we've got a whole breakfast selection, coffees, teas, different um, stores selling those things. And yeah, I'm mostly just wanting to do fresh produce supporting homemade local storeholders and uh, local producers. Whether it's a pit stop along your Midlands meander, a coffee and croissant or tasty lunch, the Karkla Farmer's Market really does cater to all tastes and is a place that all can come to experience what Harvick Produce has to offer. For the more adventurous, you can zip line your way through the Karkla Forest and really see the natural beauty of the Midlands. Um, so we are at Karkloof Canopy Tour, which is in the heart of the Natal Midlands in KZN. Um, and uh, we're here next to the second largest indigenous uh, forest in southern Africa. Ten amazing zip lines, um, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. A canopy tour is a concept that originated in Costa Rica where scientists wanted to study animals and birds in the canopy of the forest, which is that top, top layer of the forest. And so their research was quite hampered by the inability to move around in the canopy of the forest. So the solution was to attach a cable from one tree to the next, from that tree to the next, from that tree to the next. Probably about 60% of our business is just um, local tourists, honeymoon couples, families, and um, those sorts of people that are on holiday. Um, and then the difference is then team building. We do a lot of team building. We offer a fantastic package with team building where we, we actually look at fear and how fear holds us back as individuals and as teams because we noticed how much, how often people arrive here uh, and say, I'm not doing this, forget it. My family or my colleagues, they can go and do this thing. I'm not going. We've got quite good at convincing them. Just try the first one. If you don't like it, you can come back down, sit in the coffee shop, have a cappuccino, and uh, inevitably, most people, 99% of people, try the first one and realize, hang on, this is not so bad. I can do this. The Canopy Tour provides a safe yet exhilarating experience for all ages. 
conquer your fears, and we promise you, you'll be begging for more. What better place to soar through the forests and experience nature in all its glory than the picturesque Midlands of KwaZulu-Natal? The Nelson Mandela Capture Site in Harwick stands as a landmark of the place in which Madiba was captured and commemorates his life and struggle for freedom for all South Africans. Well, behind me is a sculpture which we developed uh, together with the artist Marco Cianfanelli. And it is a place where Nelson Mandela disappeared from. It's a place that he came back to. And now in the centenary year of his birth, uh, we are celebrating that. And he returns again as you walk down this pathway behind me. And at a particular moment, and you st stand on a particular place, and Nelson Mandela's face appears in front of you. The site also houses a museum telling the story of Madiba's entire life, imprisonment and struggle for freedom and is currently expanding to include a larger part of Madiba's history and the struggle that happened in KZN. As you come onto the site, there's a new museum behind you which is close to completion now, we're probably 98% there. We're going to be putting a new exhibition into that, uh, ex into that museum, which not only tells the life and times of Nelson Mandela, but it tells the struggle in KZN with the steps of Nelson Mandela walking through it. What I, what I had hoped is that it would become a major attraction, not only for local visitors, but international visitors. And I must say, within a week to 10 days of this sculpture being erected, the image of Nelson Mandela and his face that you see behind me uh, shot around the world. Starting with a trip to the museum, one can walk along the path toward the sculpture and take a moment to realize the magnitude of the sacrifices made and appreciate the subsequent freedom we, as South Africans, experience today. All our episodes are online, which means there are even more travel ideas to go through. Why not join our Facebook page and encourage your friends and family to do so too? Shukran for joining me this week and I look forward to seeing you next week, same time, same place. Assalamu alaikum from me, Sahra Robinson. Mm -hmm.